I was born and raised in Kenya for quite a long time, so and I uh, schooled and worked there. I I especially worked in early childhood projects in Kenya and uh, have seen changes around children and how they are brought up now and how the school is. And so I have a lot of interest in, in getting to learn how children are learning today in the preschools. So when I was growing up, we had a lot of fun. And school was uh, fun to us. And it was better to go to school than to stay home. Because in the global south, uh, in, Ke in Kenya and other countries, our parents scan us very well when you make a mistake. School was more safer, although they, we were being kept there, but their chances were less, and there was more time for us to stay there and play. So whenever we got a chance, that was. But things have changed now, and children doesn't want to go to school at that tender age of preschool. So that raised the question, what is happening? Within a few years, if by the time I, I was in preschool, several years though, but then instead of children liking school more with the increase of technology and more teacher trainings, then they don't. So uh, I looked at, uh, I worked in schools for some time the previous years, and uh, then I came to Cambridge to study, and I'm studying play, and one of my areas that I'm looking at now is to look at the perception of teachers and parents about play-based learning, because what can change the situation now where children don't want to go to school because they feel burdened if, if learning becomes more playful in those schools. So that's my topic of research, and uh, I just want to give you something to think about as you listen, that, uh, this research is an ongoing process now, and therefore your uh, input or recommendations will be of help to me. So listen and also think of what else can we be able, can I be able to do to improve it? Are we together up there? Is that, is that, is that assignment good for you? Yeah. yeah, I'm a teacher by background, so if I keep asking you questions, that will be okay for you, so. It's fine, so, so the, the big question is why research in play in preschools in particular? So learning through play is seen as one of the ways of ensuring that children receive quality learning in ECD, mostly by those who are proponents of play. And any teacher you ask, will tell you, yes, I'm using play. But then that is something we are going to see as we move on. However, there's an increased focus in direct instruction, which has resulted to increase in play, and mainly attributed to the strong push for quality, high quality learning in the preschool. So it's no longer a place to go and play and enjoy and grow was a place for learning. The need for learners uh, to prepare for school, and that's when we talk of preparing for school, is the transition that they need to have to the primary schooling. So teachers feel the burden to prepare them for this transition through a lot of numeracy and uh, uh, literacy work. There's a prescribed curriculum that uh, standards that are there now in most countries that these teachers need to, to follow to prepare these children. And then there's an increased pressure internationally of quantifiable test uh, outcomes and tests. So all of these have compounded to the pressure that uh, uh, the teachers feel. There are also different views held by both parents and teachers on the use of play-based learning and the, uh, that has been uh, researched. And uh, so to understand all of this and in the context of Kenya, I. I, did, I, I sought out to get uh, the views that teachers and uh, parents have. Uh, so that is the main aim of my research. So those are my research questions. One is to the perception that school administrators, teachers, and parents have on play-based learning in schools. Two is uh, 
how is play-based learning implemented in the Kenyan EC curriculum and what about and the ECD policy that guides it. So ECD is early childhood education, ECD is early childhood education. ECD is early childhood development and education, sorry. So it's more broader. So I also sought out to look at the barriers to the implementation of play-based learning in uh, the two organizations I work for, I, I, I'm, I'm working with, sorry, that is the Madras Early Childhood Project in Kenya and the Kidogo Program. The Madras Early Childhood, uh, Early Childhood Program in Kenya is affiliated to the Aga Khan Foundation. Kidogo is a, a program on its own that runs ECID Center, so I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's the map of Africa. That's where Kenya is. If you move the Kenya out a bit, then those are my research sites. So one is in Nairobi, that's where Kidogo is based. And one is Mombasa, that's where the Madrasa Childhood uh, Program, the schools that I, I worked, uh, that I researched are based. So there are those two sites. I use purely qualitative case study of those two project sites. I chose those two project sites because they implement play-based learning. That's what they say, they implement play-based learning. So I was interested first to understand what is this play-based learning that they are doing. And two, to also to see how do they integrate the curriculum that they have into, the curriculum that the government have into implementation of play-based learning. If you remember the uh, presentation by Benjamin, he said play-based or playful learning is a strategy. So it's like a method of, of teaching. So I wanted to really understand how do they do it? And then if the other research question was to see how, what barrier. So the study sites are Kidogo, which is in Nairobi, uh, and uh, Madrasa Childhood uh, Education, uh, Madrasa Childhood Projects in Kenya, and uh, that's based in Mombasa, as I indicated in the previous slide. The my study methods, uh, I did interviews for both teachers and parents. Then I observed the teachers in class to get to understand what, they, what is it that they are doing in terms of implementing play-based learning. And then uh, I'm also doing a document review of uh, teacher documents, like the lesson plans and the documents they use in school as well as the syllabus and, uh, and the CD policy. The, the, the study is coming at an interesting time as well in Kenya because the Kenya is slowly changing the, the curriculum that they are using, and there are a lot of changes around the uh, preschool as well. So just uh, small pictures of where those schools are located. One, the Kidogo in Nairobi, those are the the schools, one is in the, the, the one in the, your left, sorry, is, uh, is in Kibera. Kibera is uh, one of the biggest slums. So they have this school there because Kidogo was initially started to be able to help working mothers be able to have somewhere to put their children in a, a daycare. Then later they realized that uh, uh, there was need to expand, and therefore they established what they call hubs, a preschool setup where these children uh, can be able to learn beyond after the three years when they are in daycare, then they move to four years and five years. And my focus is the four and five years. So the other one on the right is still uh, uh, Kidogo, but that's another study site, so I had two in that area. Then the Madrasa Early Childhood Program uh, is at the coastal city of Kenya, the coastal town of Kenya in Mombasa. So that is one of their play equipment and playground, and uh, those are their classes. And uh, uh, the most of the schools, or almost all of the schools I visited, are established next to a mosque, because they do the integrated learning. The learners are taught both Islamic education and uh, what I call, quote unquote, the normal education curriculum that other children learn, so they do what we call integrated learning at, as early as at preschool level. My data collection methods, as I indicated, are uh, in-depth interviews, observations, uh, and document review. 
So in terms of uh, interviews, those are the number of teachers I did uh, work with, uh, a total of 26 teachers were interviewed and uh, the interviews were both, uh, I interviewed them first, observed and did a post uh, observation interviews. Then I also interviewed the parents on what they think about the use of play and whether they knew there was even play in those schools in the first place or what was their interest in those schools. That was something I was interested in knowing. So some of the sample research questions that I had, so not research questions, but interview questions that I had, whether you think, uh, whether teacher, do you, uh, whether, do you think teachers should be encouraged to integrate play while engaging children in academic learning? So I was very specific to with the parents that, yes, your learners are learning in class. Do you think the teachers should engage them in some playful activities that help them learn? If yes, why? And if no, why not? Then based on their experience, how is, is play related to learning? So I asked both parents and teachers what they think. Is there a relationship between play and learning? Are they two different things? Can they go together? Or what's their thought? And then I also asked teachers what challenges they experience while implementing play-based learning in their classes. So some of the documents I plan to review, the, ones, the first one is a curriculum design for the new curriculum that is in Kenya. Also want to look at the timetables. Uh, it came very interesting uh, in part of my outcome in observations and there are some of these are teacher records. I'm doing a thematic analysis, those process, so I'll just go over that very first then. So those are, um, uh, I'm at the start of my, uh, doing my, uh, doing my analysis. So these are preliminary f findings. So one of the things or the themes that are coming up is the pressure uh, from parents. As one of the things teachers are saying, it's a, it's a hindrance for them to be able to implement. Remember these schools that I'm going to are established on that basis of doing play-based learning. And that's what why, that's my interest was there to try and see. But uh, so like one teacher said to me, I cannot say that I have left the other one completely. The other one is where he does direct teaching. So he cannot say he has left it completely because parents, when they bring their children to school, they want to know what the, children, the child is doing. So the teacher goes on to say, when I joined, the organization, I was doing learning through play. So there's a time a parent was forced to remove the child from this school. So that's one observation of the, of the teacher. And that shows you the level of pressure they have from parents to be able to do this direct teaching and uh, they are not able to implement the play-based teaching the way they want. The other, uh, uh, observation that comes up uh, is, is uh, the time. So teachers uh, really talked about time and complained that it's, it's, so, it's, it's not possible to implement play-based learning because of the time that they have. So, and this is the interesting part. In preschool, uh, the lesson takes 30 minutes. So they should learn uh, an activity area or a quote-unquote a subject, depending on how it's called, for, a th for that means then move to another th thing. But teachers find that the 30 minutes are not enough if they have to use play-based. And that's based on, uh, during my observation, I, I was able to establish why. Because a teacher do, needs to do a variety of things to be able to ensure the learners are complete, so they need to do partly play a bit, then write, maybe play again. So there's a lot of activities that goes on. So the church is saying that you get that moving from one activity area to another, you find it is very difficult. By the time children finish, you find tidying up, because they are in play base, they are using a lot of materials. Tidying up takes a long time for everything to be taken back to the learning center so that you can introduce another lesson. So uh, I, was asked, I, was, uh, I was asking what do, what do they think generally about uh, play-based learning? What is their thinking? Is it good to use play-based? 
So one of the teachers said, it makes learning enjoyable and it makes the class lively by driving away boredom. That's what that came really a lot in my data, that it drives away boredom. It, may, it develops positive interest towards learning. It makes the child to love going to school because learning is not boring. It's not just about writing. Another a parent said, because I am thinking you can learn a lot as you play, so I don't think you can separate the two, but you can learn without playing. I think you can learn without playing. You can play without learning. There is a thin line. So you can see the level of thought process between play and learning that goes on in that parent's mind. And the parent is all, is all very clear to the parent that these things are different or they're the same or they should go together or not. So the parent concludes by saying there's a very thin line because you can learn as you play and you can also play as you learn. So those are a few findings that are coming up uh, as I do my preliminary analysis. Uh, but there's a lot of questions that come in uh, from, from that data because the reality around preschool is to build this foundation for these learners to be able to learn. So moving on, so pictures, uh, I've just a few pictures of those classes that I visited that show how a play-based class, uh, classroom looks like. So I'm also looking at these characteristics that define to these teachers in this context what a play-based cl classroom should look like. like. So if you see this, the tables are far away on the corner. There's a mat where they sit most of the time to be able to learn. So that's not a typical classroom in uh, a preschool classroom in Kenya. So it, it's very specific to this kind of context. This is an activity that learners were doing to show that uh, to one of the activities during my observation showing a play-based learning. So they were doing a mathematics uh, activity or a mathematical activity on uh, putting together at a uh, PP2 level. PP2, you have five-year-olds. That's the last level before you go to, they go to grade one. But then instead of them just adding the teacher cutouts, nice cutouts of colored papers and give them to, to stick, then they get the answer. So, so that's the end of it. So, uh, so that's, that's the end of the work that I'm, uh, that's the end of my presentation on the work that I'm doing, not the end of the work. The work is just starting, I think. So thank you so much, first of all, you for listening, and I do hope you took my assignment and you have a number of suggestions and questions that you are going to look at at the end. So special thanks to Sarah, Mr. Vice Supervisor, and Pauline Rose, to Paul, to the Pedal Center, the Real Center, the University of Cambridge, the Lego Foundation, and the Cambridge Trust for funding the tracks that I'm doing. So thank you. Um, hi, Dominic. Um, so I'm Medea from Cities for Children, and we work with kids in under-resourced contexts as well to do play-based learning um, and playful learning programs. And I, I'm familiar with sort of the idea that play can be seen as a privilege, especially when you know if education is seen as something that's going to that's going to if there if parents are valuing education, then it's because it can lead to social mobility or it can lead to kids sort of taking the next step, changing their circumstances. And I was wondering if, um, you know, with the strategies that you were seeing and with the playful learning strategies that are being, that are being employed, um, whether there's a case to be made that actually, you know, kids are still getting to those learning outcomes or they're still getting to be prepared for school, they're still getting to be excited about school. Was there anything that you saw in terms of the results or in terms of the, um, the motivation that could build that case? Yeah, okay, so uh, I think one of the things that I saw is that, uh, okay, the learners were very uh, interested in learning in most of those classes that I did visit during my observation. They were engaged in the learning process. Uh, but I cannot talk about the measure, but I did ask the teachers during the 
the, my interviews that how do these children cope once they leave uh, the centers? Because the centers only contain them, but they doesn't have grade one and two. I also did ask the parents what they feel. And uh, the teachers were telling me when they leave and uh, they go to, to, to grade one, they're able to cope better, mostly in terms of their social, their communication. They are able to express themselves to the teachers. But uh, because they tend to use a lot of, um, uh, there are two issues that came up. One is on how they, within these centers, they don't, uh, how would you put it? They don't implement severe discipline to the learners, like they are not pinched, they are not canned, they are not done what. When they go to grade one, these things happen, and therefore these learners tend to uh, shy away fast before they are able to adapt to that kind of environment. But they are saying, the teachers were saying, once they adapt, they actually do well, because they, they still get reports on how the learners that went through the, the school did. The parents, on the other hand, some of them uh, like the environment and how learners were coming up. And I think one of the things that they were saying is that they wish the schools under these centers were able to have grade one, grade two, and grade three, then they would not move them away when they need to go to grade one. So those shows some positive elements of uh, this, uh, uh, the pro that the programs are having, but I cannot say I don't quantitatively measure because I don't have any follow-up study that has been done on these learners when they move. That was my initial thought when uh, I, I, I wanted to start my PhD to see. But then I asked myself the question that I cannot move to measure what I really don't know what is happening. Because they, it's really easy to say we are doing play-based when it's not this no form of play-based at all direct teaching. So I felt, let me get to understand what is happening first, maybe in another phase, then we can be able to measure how these learners are and what, uh, what they are their outcome is. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Melissa, and I'm a doctoral student at the faculty. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the context of play in Kenya. You mentioned, um, I think when you were a child, you were saying that it was much better to go to school than not, because uh, it was, and maybe I misheard that, but it was more fun. I was wondering if you could speak to like today, like the opportunity for kids to do play, and specifically like risk play or adventurous play outside of school in the context of those cities. I think that's a good question. So uh, I think basically what, uh, and may, this may not be in Kenya alone, I think uh, all over the world, we understand there's a lot of schoolification, even within the preschool. There's a lot of entry into literacy, numeracy, and preparation of these learners for school. Learners are spending more time in school than they used to do before. There are full-time preschool programs now where learners go at eight and maybe live around four. They are young children, by the time they reach home, uh, they, uh, and at times they even have the homework to, that they have to do at home to show parents there's something happening in school. So with that context alone, then it, it shows you, and that happens now in very many schools. It started in Kenya with the private school. Private schools are non-government owned schools in Kenya. And then it has slowly now moved to even the public schools. Teachers need to give something to be able to show that they are working. Although most of the preschools in Kenya are community owned, there are a few that are owned by the government, that are co uh, county government owned now, but the whole trend is there. So that in itself will show you that there's a reduction of this time of play. There's a strict timetable uh, that these learners have to follow now show you, or well, I think it's also in one of the pictures, with specific time when they need to be out and when they need to be in, the one at the center. So it has a specific time when these learners need to go for outdoor to play and then come back to class, and this, this circle continues almost on a daily basis. So it tells you this, there, there is a, 
a change. The time I was in school, uh, I was in preschool, and that's also something I asked many parents if they didn't think that they feel has changed. They are able to point out that, okay, we are, are, my children are spending more time in school now, and for them, they were very happy about that. They are very happy about that, uh, that children are spending more time in school and are, to them, they are able to learn more now than their time. Yeah. Time for one more question. Hello, I'm Alida and I come from Greece, from the organization Playing. Um, you mentioned that it's very difficult to, well, the previous um, Helen Dodd mentioned that it's difficult to um, define play, and you mentioned that it's difficult to define what play-based is for different people. And I assume that's the case in every country. Um, but uh, sometimes what I've found is that uh, play-based uh, learning or play-based teaching is defined in juxtaposition, in, in, in con contradiction with direct learning. So if people are not doing direct instruction, they think they're doing play-based, which may not be the case. And especially if it's hands-on, they feel that it's definitely play-based, which again may not be the case. So how have you found that difficult? How have you managed to go through with that? I think you've ended with a very good question and uh, a very tricky one for that matter. So I think um, I'm looking at play-based learning within the preschool uh, in terms of uh, play as a continuum as proposed by Pyle, which runs from the free play, cooperative play, until you go to games and that kind. So I'm looking at play through all that lens to be able to position where most of the teachers are and what they do in their classes. But that's aside, that's my, pers but my perspective of looking at it. What I found in the field is like what you are saying that most teachers, their definition of play was use of materials and it ended at that point. So whenever there was use of materials, play-based learning was happening. When there was no use of materials, play-based learning was not happening. 